Hello and welcome to the Cookbook Circle podcast. I'm Hannah. And I'm Victoria. And we've set out to review the UK's most popular cookbooks, those that you probably have at home and haven't opened in a while. We take one cookbook each episode to cook from and to stress test, digging out their best recipes, bringing them to life again, and hopefully inspiring you to do so too. Hello, Victoria. <laughs> Hello, Hannah. That was that was rhythmic. It's like a national anthem. Is it? <laughs> yes. Of oh. um, the royal state of Victoria. <laughs> dumb. <laughs> Victoria, dumb. Oh yeah, I know it well. Bit depressing. <laughs> Very poor country. <laughs> Very busy little country. Busy little country, but no money. <laughs> nothing to nothing to give. <laughs> Where you been? Who you seen? What you doing? <laughs> <laughs> what do you know? Well, really big news in London this week, as you may be aware, I think you are aware, um, as finally, finally, Salt Bay <laughs> opened his restaurant. Do you think that we talk a bit too much about Salt Bay? <laughs> we have mentioned him before on a podcast, maybe twice. But a lot of people, maybe more than that. people don't necessarily know who he is. We should explain that a few years ago... <laughs> A video. Please explain. <laughs> I'm trying. I'm reaching <laughs> back. Meme. This is the kind of useless <laughs> fucking information that I hold on to instead of really important stuff like my PIN number for my credit card. <laughs> um, that Salt Bay went viral for this video of how he was salting. Was it a steak? It was a steak, right? It's always meat. It's a steak. He's a very yeah. meaty man. Um, you know, in his. <laughs> In his outlook, not physically. Um, and he was physically, like, he's quite slight. He is slight. He loves a round, sun, round pair of sunglasses. And he was like <laughs> holding up his hand in quite a like maybe if you were like miming like a swan or a periscope, <laughs> <laughs> and sprinkling the salt in a very extra way. And this shit went crazy viral, and thus salt bay was born he was born i mean i think he was already he had restaurants right yeah in like, dubai and stuff but thank god he's here now in london where is he is it knightsbridge i think it's knightsbridge of course it's knightsbridge yeah i mean i you know i he baffles me um <laughs> the whole thing baffles me so he was the restaurant was delayed unfortunately oh. due to this little pandemic that we've been having oh, um so sad <laughs> so Lots of people are talking about it, but I don't think lots of people will be attending this restaurant. Attending, that's how you say. That's how. That's the verb you use for, for restaurants. You sound like you're learning French. <laughs> I'm, I'm attending McDonald's this evening. <laughs> oh, I don't think people will be going for attending. Well, it's fucking expensive. <laughs> And that's the point. Like, it's it's almost like a joke mm. how expensive it is. Or, like, he does, like, these steaks yeah. that are covered in precious metals. But, well, markedly gold. <laughs> precious. They're wrapped in gold. Ugh. And, like, I have a lot of feelings about gold in food. Me too. And none of them, none of them are positive no. at all. Like, yeah. I don't want to eat gold. No. I want to wear it, maybe. Yeah. I, I, I want to... I don't need to shit it out, frankly. It's it's a waste of my money. But it adds nothing. No, it's not delicious. No, it just makes something look a bit bougie. Yeah. So they have um a range of gold covered steaks starting at four hundred and fifty pounds. Oh my god. That's price, not weight, right? <laughs> <laughs> I hope not. That's a big old cow. I don't know. <laughs> Is it? I don't know. I actually got no idea. That might be the perfect size cow. A whole cow. <laughs> Covered in gold, <laughs> so they, they, that's that's the starting range. But you're, you know, if you wanted a tomahawk, which you can share, to be fair. Oh, that's nice one. Covered in yeah. gold, but it is mostly bone. If you've ever seen a tomahawk, it's mostly bone, um, and that's fourteen hundred and fifty pounds. Wow. Plus, I'm sure your drinks plus a twelve point five percent service charge at least. Do you think you get potatoes with that? <laughs> <laughs> no, I think you have to buy them separately. I saw on Twitter because everybody talks about you know everyone talks about this and, and this is like the beauty of it, right? Like this is this is his whole PR yeah, yeah. thing. It's like people will talk about how expensive it is. But I saw this receipt from his Miami restaurant because of course he's got a fucking Miami restaurant. Yeah. And the bill, I don't know how many people they were, but like two French fries was like thirty dollars. Oh. And yeah, the bill came to like seven thousand dollars. Oh my god! Do you remember Leonardo DiCaprio? 
it was there was like a video of, or a photo of him with Leonardo DiCaprio as well right after he went viral, which made me really sad because I really like Leonardo DiCaprio. I was disappointed in him. And he's all about saving the world. Why are you eating steak? That's a very good point. Yeah. Well, his girlfriends don't eat anything, so they make <laughs> That's up true. for it. It's fine. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's just it's all just a bit gross, a bit distasteful. It's very flashy. He's very flashy. He's always wearing sunglasses. There was another video of him that was like where he was slicing some meat. The first one was the sprinkling of the salt, and then there was the slicing of the meat, and he was doing it in such a like weirdly grotesque and somewhat like erotic way. <laughs> And it really chilled me to the bone. It was absolutely awful. I'm not a fan of that man. If he's not there when you go to his restaurant, like, do you get a discount or do, do you pay more? But because he's there, because if he sprinkles salt on your on your steak, is that a good thing? Like, like I don't know. And like, it is gross and it is horrible. But like, also, you're you're ripping off rich people, which and footballers and Leonardo DiCaprio. So I don't really mind. You know, like it's, you know, if they're going to want to pay £1,400 for a steak plus extras, then... Yeah, more for you. Go ahead. Like, we'll all go to Hawksmoor and be happy. Yeah, I'd like to check when he's salting the steak as well. You know, I'd like to, <laughs> I'd like to see Samin Nasrat and him get together. <laughs> and do like a salt bay fat ass. Yeah. <laughs> salt bay fat ass. I like that. So, yeah, he's grim, right? I feel like he's not, like he's not my guy. My salt bay is the ocean. <laughs> <laughs> For her big birthday, I got her a tote bag that said, cookbooks are my nightclub, because she said this in a previous yeah. episode, and I loved it very Stays much. true. <laughs> and now I know what round two, next year's birthday will be. My <laughs> salt bay is, bay is ocean. the ocean. <laughs> Happy for you, Salt Bear. You do you. We'll see you never. <laughs> yeah, he's truly just going to fade away. But, <laughs> but, <laughs> however, though. Anyway, yeah. but. The book that we're talking about today is Salt Bear's Guide to. <laughs> Sorry. What is our book today? Tell me, please. Marcella Hazan, Essentials of Classic Italian Ooh. Cooking. Ooh. And this is our last book of the season. We can't talk about that yet. I'll get a bit sad. Okay. What do you know about Marcel Hazan? Literally nothing. Well, I, I tell you what I do know about her. The the two sentences I read at the beginning of this book. She's Italian. She married a man who was a wine writer. Well, I've got things to tell you about him. I've got things to tell oh. you about her. I've got things to tell you about the book. I've got it all, Victoria. Don't you oh my worry. God, Hit me with it. So Marcella was born in 1924. Same. <laughs> Your soul was. <laughs> in Cesenatico, I'm going to say. That's how that's pronounced. Is that good? How's it go? Cesenatico. <laughs> I like how you're in it. <laughs> you soften your voice so much to speak Italian. <laughs> Aren't you grateful for that? Um, so it's a little fishing village in Emilia Romagna. Romagna? I don't know. <laughs> I lost it. It's gone. Um, Love that. Which is apparently Italy's most or foremost gastronomic region. So yeah, your foodiest part of Italy. All the good shit up there, right? Parma ham. Bo- yeah. Bologna is up there. Parmesan. Parmesan. Yeah. Parma. Balsamic. It's all there. Speaking of balsamic. Um, she, which I did, I don't know if you heard me, but I said balsamic. <laughs> Speaking of balsamic, which we weren't. Um, apparently she's credited with making balsamic quite uh, mainstream, oh. but then kind of regretted it because she saw it kind of being misused right. and like... She liked it before it was cool. <laughs> she was a balsamic a hipster. <laughs> from the university of she began her early childhood in egypt and she broke her arm there and apparently after nearly losing her arm to poor medical treatment she her father decided that they should go back to italy where he was from for the surgery and then they stayed there and she was a teenager during world war ii and they moved to lake garda for a bit not realizing that it would be one of the war's greatest targets so that does not sound fun and there was loads of bombings and stuff when she was finished school she studied natural sciences and biology in the university of ferrara i don't know if that's not right but i like saying it like that (laughs) the university of prada i would totally go there (laughs) she met victor who was the love of her life 
And there's a little bit, I'll tell you a little bit more about him later. He sounds like quite a big influence in her foodiness. Right. But apparently she couldn't really cook when she was growing up at all. It doesn't really make sense why, because apparently in her biography, she mentions that she had a mother, that she had a mother. <laughs> do, you, have you had, do you have one of those? No. Nah. <laughs> Never heard of them. And two <laughs> grandmothers. The women in her life were apparently amazing cooks, but she couldn't do any of it um, until she married Victor and they moved to New York City. She couldn't speak any English at all. Oh, shit. And she couldn't, yeah, she couldn't cook. So, but when she was there, she wanted to learn how to cook for her new husband. <laughs> then she was kind of learning from him and learning from Italian cookbooks and then kind of developed a bit of an instinct for it. So then she started going to this Chinese cooking class, as you do. Okay. You know, Chinese food and Italian food. Very thing, similar. Pretty much. Yeah. Soy sauce, balsamic. It's all the same. <laughs> dumplings ravioli <laughs> yeah the teacher quit this chinese cooking class and then her the fellow students my fellow, fellow students suggested that she te- start teaching them italian food instead that's a pivot i like it pretty sweet <laughs> and then they got really popular and she was teaching them from her apartment in manhattan this was during the 60s and then this big new york times food hotshot critic writer guy craig claiborne came along for lunch wrote a story and then she just became this massive culinary star just this kind of new italian influence in america that sounds insane i know right so she couldn't cook she went to a class to learn how to cook and end up taking that class yes yeah. failing upwards i've like i've never heard like that is shout out to her being a woman and that happening to her because i know a lot of men that that would happen to and it would be you know yeah the start of their career but you know I guess it just shows you that even shit Italian cooks are probably better than the rest of us <laughs> like, True. the instincts yeah better than <laughs> most so then she kind of became this like Amazon talks about how she's America's premier teacher of Italian cooking she later set up schools in New York and Bologna and Venice as well so mm. it wasn't just America but yeah so Victor her husband he had apparently his English was great and, and he's like kind of a bit of a presence all throughout her books there's a lot of recipes that they have his name in them or something because he loves them or that he makes them at home there's one that's pasta alla moda di Victor and it's like with puts cream in to some pasta with parmesan and butter you're you're a fucking nightmare actually that recipe and, um, yeah, it. but uh, he, he would allow no one else to prepare this dish and they were apparently really in love and, and stayed together both of their lifetimes which is quite lovely but he was a bit dismissive of her double doctorate when they met in the early 50s uh he himself was going to be a writer <laughs> And of course, yeah, he, he spent it. Uh, the New York Times said that he spent his time swanning about as a kind of faux country squire, which made me think of you. <laughs> me? <laughs> you know, you're always swanning me. around like a faux country <laughs> squire. In my wellies and barber jacket. Yeah, it's weed. I fucking hate the countryside. But he was the son of Italian Jews who had fled with him to the US when he was 10. So they both had these crazy interesting childhoods just before World War II. Mm. And they were his family were so opposed to him marrying someone who wasn't Jewish, which Marcella wasn't, that they cut him off when they got married. Oh shit. But apparently in time it kind of war warmed back up and he returned to his father's fur business in New York. <laughs> But Marcella writes in her biography that it was quite a while before his parents kind of overcame the hostility towards her. But yeah. Another time. Yeah, That's... totally. For, for shop, even. <laughs> that in itself. <laughs> he was dismissive of her double doctorate, but he wants to go off selling furs. Okay, mate. Yeah. <laughs> so she wrote books throughout her career. And as I said, she had cookery schools. In 1998, she retired from um, the schools and, and she and Victor moved to Longbook Key in Florida lovely oh, don't all people retire in florida in the u.s <laughs> yeah that's the rules you should get your american passport that's it <laughs> yeah fergus henderson in the guardian the chef behind st john wrote about how she wrote to him and invited him to come see her in florida and, and to, to make him lunch or to make him dinner and he he kind of put it off and then he realized what he was doing like he had this amazing invitation from this really famous chef so he flew over yeah. and it sounds it's a really nice piece actually we should share it when this comes out but it's so f- interesting how all these chefs kind of connect in different ways because there was something that I read later as well about how Marcella Hazan wasn't happy with her publisher of the first couple of books and then Julia Child put her in touch with her publisher and so you just realize that this whole network even you know 
that was like the 60s or whatever but the yeah. Fergus Henderson thing was only about 20 years ago so it's just fascinating yeah when when Hazan was in Florida then she found that she couldn't get loads of the Italian ingredients that she could get really easily in New York and um, she decided to write a cookbook for people who were in the same pos- position who couldn't get kind of authentic stuff so full accessibility points to Marcella there um, and that was she released a book in 2004 called Marcella Says but yeah just about kind of her personality it seems like she was quite similar to Elizabeth David in a way and I guess it's just like any of these right. women who had to succeed at this time they had to be quite strong willed quite um yeah. true to what they were doing but yeah there was there was lots in what I read up about about how both her and Victor were quite difficult to work with especially from a publisher's point of view there was loads of like bitching about like the cover designs or like low numbers of right. first prints or stuff like that and apparently even when she was teaching her classes that she would <laughs> there's a bit that says she recalls that ordering her manicured students to clean squid would invariably provoke a battle of the wills and it was a battle I never lost so she sounds like nice. quite a feisty character but yeah she did I mean amazing things she's just and then so this book this book combined two of her bestsellers before it so the classic Italian cookbook and more classic Italian cooking mm. so it brought all together and then this was published in 1992 and so if you count the classic Italian cookbook, then this is the most mentioned cookbook on our list. It's the on it's our number list, one. Yeah, that's why we saved it till last. That's why we saved it till last, and it's it's kind of pitched as this accessible, comprehensive guide to authentic Italian. It kind of takes you through different techniques and the contents of the Italian pantry, and then goes through like different stages on the menu. She's got chapters on things like soups and and talks about like different areas in Italy. She says that a vegetable soup can tell you where you are in Italy almost as price precisely as a map nice and yeah you uh, there's like menu ideas in the back it obviously goes through pizza pasta risotto every vegetable she loves to <laughs> smother a vegetable did you notice that she really does yeah every vegetable is vegetable like fennel smothered in butter some <laughs> smothered in parmesan every single vegetable has a smothering recipe in there as well yeah it's like just have one smothering recipe and say you can do this to everyone <laughs> yeah everyone to everyone smother everyone Not everyone in, if i had to choose how to die i'd probably choose being smothered in butter and parmesan <laughs> I mean, not me, obviously. I wouldn't like, enjoy that. No. But. You could be smothered in, I don't know. What would you be smothered in? I don't know, like ramen. <laughs> I like that. And, um, <laughs> cool. And then the, the last, the most famous <laughs> recipe from this book is probably this tomato sauce that's just like mm. all over the internet maybe you've made it I won't ask you yet but it's this like very simple tomato sauce that has just three ingredients of tomatoes preferably fresh but in some recipes it says you can use those San Marzano tinned ones yeah yeah an onion and butter you don't even have to chop the onion you just like submerge it into the tomatoes and butter <laughs> and you kind of reduce it all down I've made it loads and it is really good, but it's definitely that that comes from this book, and it's probably the most internet famous tomato sauce ever, yeah. just because it's so simple. Because people love to argue about tomato sauce, right? Yeah. And like as for pastas, and I feel like that one, it's it's like it's labor intensive, but it's also easy. Yeah. And it's always going to come up delicious. Yeah. I didn't make it for this. Okay. Spoiler alert. But we've made it before. Yeah. And it's delicious. Do you know what I find interesting is a lot of people put a pinch of sugar in their tomato sauces. That mm. one doesn't have a pinch of sugar. And I don't know if that's viewed as really inauthentic if you put like a pinch of sugar. We always do in mm. my family. Maybe it's a, if you have good tomatoes, you don't need the sugar. Yeah. Because if they're bad, not bad tomatoes, but, but yeah, bad tomatoes or not good enough tomatoes. We're talking about tomatoes yeah, again. Yeah, here we are. Things, everyone drink. Um, <laughs> then I guess they're so acidic yes. that you need that sugar. But maybe if they're good, fresh, or like the imported Samazano ones. Then yes. Yeah. They're delicious. I guess that. It's just a testament to good tomatoes or ripe tomatoes. Good tomatoes. That's our just, you know, band name of life. Good, good tomatoes. Good tomatoes. But yeah, what were your first impressions? of the book i was obviously excited about this book because we've had an italian book apart from jamie's um 
book. But that, is that was that Italian book? Not really. But he had Italian food in there. Anyway, um, less about Jamie Oliver, more about this book. Um, <laughs> Look, if we're I... saying that we've mentioned Artelengi in every episode, then that's me fangirling. We've also just Jamie Oliver. By we, I mean you. <laughs> in every episode sorry jamie i love you it's all right i'll buy a new book to together conversate. i won't i won't <laughs> i won't buy you a new book yeah it, it's again it's a big one but we knew that because it's a it's two books i was excited about it because it's, it's italian food and that's obviously different to other foods notably french um <laughs> Food, so I was excited. I like Italian food. I like lots of things about this book, actually. I really like the way that the recipes are laid out. Mm -hmm. So in the ingredients list, they are listed in order of use, which is good. And not a given these days. No. But also she lists the equipment that you're going to need. Yes, I love that. Yeah, I absolutely love that. I think it's great. A pastry brush or... Yeah, a baking sheet or... Yeah, an oven-proof casserole dish. <laughs> Fire-proof casserole dish. Yeah, and um, I just think that's great. I think I also loved the pasta section. Yeah. Amazing because it's like vast. But also, she doesn't expect you to make your own pasta. She talks about it and there's yeah. a couple of recipes in there. But she says, look, it's to buy is almost as good. Um, yeah. And then she has these lists... Uh, at the end of the pasta list. section, we love a list where you kind of can see the pasta shape that you like, and she will guide you to the recipes in that yes. book that go with that pasta shape. And I yeah. think that's great. Me too. So, like, if you don't love fusily, because I feel like a lot of people maybe don't, because it's a very normal, you know, bit like you might be overexposed to fusily. I don't know. Um, then you don't. <laughs> I don't know why that's made me laugh. <laughs> I don't know. But anyway, if you don't like Fusely, then don't eat the fried courgettes with garlic and basil on page 181. But also this list is then split into fresh, as in you've made it. Yeah. Homemade. Homemade is the word, not fresh. And, you know, factory made box dry pasta. <laughs> Which has less of a ring to it, let's be honest. Yeah. <laughs> So loved that. Yeah, what did you think? I was very excited about this because I just feel like Italian is is my go-to anyway. And I've kind of naturally veered towards a lot of the Italian stuff that in previous episodes, even if they're not necessarily Italian books. And you can get a bit like unimaginative about what to put in your pasta. Yeah. It was just fascinating to see so many different sauces and like quite simple as well I found everything like quite if you're not going to make your pasta like it's relatively there's not yeah there's a lot of simple stuff yeah yeah good go bene sorry I'm wow, sorry you're racking up these Italian phrases today I love it <laughs> but how did you feel about no no photos oh yeah a lot of people talk about it in the Amazon reviews actually that's interesting I didn't feel like I missed out because you know pasta yeah I can probably imagine it one of the things I cooked it was a bit different to what I'm used to. So I would have maybe liked some guidance on how that was to look. Yes. And a couple other things, actually, like the, something I almost cooked and bought all the stuff and then just haven't had time, unfortunately. I, yeah, I would have liked to understand like what that could have looked, would have, would have looked like. Yeah. But it's such a beast of a book. I understand why there's no photos. There is some nice illustrations. Yeah. Um, but they're a bit like hoppies, you know. Well, they're not as abstract as hoppies, but there's, yeah. like, there's a, a lemon or, yeah. you know, a picture of how to bone a... No. <laughs> <laughs> how to bone a what? <laughs> what are we chicken. boning today? <laughs> I just saw a chicken. How to bone. Debone? Debone. Break yeah. down? I know, bone. <laughs> I, sometimes I think with these books as well, an old school food photo can age a cookbook like yeah. nothing else, yeah. right? So I think that in some ways, they, these are kind of making themselves more timeless if they don't have... A badly lit unstyled food photos yeah my one um my one observation is that there's a lot more butter involved in some of this cooking than maybe i would have thought yeah in italian cooking you think you you presume that their fat is olive oil yes over butter but there's oftentimes it's both right it's yeah i find that quite interesting yeah what did you cook what did i cook what did you cook from Marcella Hazan? That's the second verse to the uh, national anthem of Victoria Stan or wherever it was. 
the essentials of classic Italian <laughs> cooking. I feel like I should march. I cooked two things. The first thing I made was the bolognese focaccia with bacon. Oh, did I you? I did. I did. Nice. I was excited. I I was just like, oh, that's interesting. I think I might have to preface this by saying that I kind of only followed the recipe like mostly, and I'll get into it into why. I mean, that's a lie. Like some bits, some bits didn't happen, but I'll explain why. Frankly, if I maybe wasn't doing this for the pod i would have deviated even even more so than i did mm. but we'll go through it yeah so my first and maybe most integral <laughs> deviation is that she wants you to make this whole recipe in the food processor like not the whole recipe ah, okay. obviously cook it in a food processor but you you make the dough in the food processor <laughs> yeah yeah i don't have a food processor big enough i have my tiny mini chopper shout out to that guy but unless we, i was going to make a tiny focaccia for little mice then that wasn't going to happen. <laughs> so, but how can you make like a bread dough in a in a food processor? Well, she says that it it worked. Wow. Um, I thought you meant like a KitchenAid, but then alas, no. No, she alas. means alas. <laughs> she means like with a blade. Oh wow! And I don't know if this is just like you know laziness on her part, which is I think is great. I, I respect great, that. Yeah. Um, Let's take it. So the first thing you have to do is like get some bacon and chop it up in a processor, which I did do in my mm-hmm. mini chopper, and then you just add. Everything all the other ingredients into the food processor amazing and then it makes a dough and okay wow. but what i did was i chopped the thing is and then i put it into my kitchen aid and just made the dough yeah. with dough hook so it's just bacon about 100 grams of bacon chopped up really really finely plain flour water salt and sugar that's it there's no olive oil in the focaccia dough oh wow yeah interesting. which is my first like that's interesting okay. yeah made a lot of focaccia in my time and I've never seen that before. You do put oil in the bowl while you're proving it. Yeah, but that's not, yeah. But then I maybe I've never eaten a focaccia from Bologna. Maybe you haven't. And you know what they say. If you haven't eaten a focaccia from Bologna, then your name then is Then shut Victoria. up. <laughs> then shut up commenting on this recipe. Just make it like it says, you idiot girl. <laughs> so <laughs> you make the dough, you let it rise for a three or four hours, whatever. Then you decant that into an oiled nine by 13 pan, mm-hmm. preferably black. She what? writes in the thing that your pan should preferably be black. I only have a dark gray one. So again, I've deviated there. It's <laughs> <That's> pretty close. <weird. laughs> Why? What's the reasoning? She doesn't give it reasoning. I, can't, I don't know. So you leave that nine by 13. Also, that's big. It's only 375 grams of flour and 300 grams of water. To really stretch it out. So you're looking at like, you know, you're going to get like a flatter focaccia. I generally prefer like a puffier, big, Me too. juicier one. So yeah. That I, but I was like, look, going to give this the benefit of the doubt. You know, yeah. nobody's calling me the best Italian food writer of all time. Um, <laughs> so what the fuck do I want? I can know? if you want. <laughs> thank, thank you. So yeah, so you leave that, to, you put it in the pan, you leave it to rise for 40 but it's, you know, spread out. In the meantime, you put a baking stone in the oven and I have a pizza stone. So I was like, fuck it, let's try it. Let's try it her way. Mm. Heat that up after it's risen a little bit more. You then, here's some more interesting stuff. You then are supposed to get a razor blade and crisscross score the top of this focaccia. Rather than the dimpling with the fingers. Yeah, none of that. Interesting. Crisscross the top and then egg wash it. Oh. Yeah. So unfortunately... We'd eaten all the eggs for breakfast. My God. And so we had no eggs. So I I, I milk washed it. So I was like, I'm going to do what she says. Yeah, and, yeah. But I was very much like, this ain't right. that's interesting. But I did look at her, her other focaccia recipes and she doesn't do that with them. So this must be a, a Bologna thing. Well, they all have variations, right? Because the Ligurian one, that they put that like brine on top of the dough. Yeah. Like, so yeah, this just must be another mad. They're mental, aren't yeah. they? Yeah. Just not. That's cr- you know. Regional, who knew? Can't relate. Um, so that goes into the oven on the baking stone in the tin yeah. for 30 minutes. Okay. And then you turn the oven off, take the bread out of the tin and put it onto the baking stone and oh. close the door for five minutes. Oh, wow. But the oven is off. off. Okay. To get a crispy bun. She doesn't say. She yeah. just tells you what to do. She you doesn't just, tell you the reasoning. Shut behind up it. and you do what she says. Shut up, close your door, <laughs> put the thing on the baking stone. And then you right. get out. Leave it to cool for a little bit. As I said, 
I was skeptical. Mm -hmm. I like a big puffy focaccia. This was much thinner, a bit like a Ligurian one. And also all the other ones, focaccias I've made, yeah, very oily. Yes. So no olive oil. You don't even drizzle on olive oil after it comes out of the oven. No, just so it's in the tray and in the bowl when you're proving. I probably put maybe a bit more than she would have liked in the tray. Yeah. So I didn't, honestly, didn't really have that much high hopes for it. But it was great. Oh, yay. It was really good. The reason I imagine, she doesn't, like I said, she doesn't explain in this, but I imagine the reason for no olive oil is because you get all your fat from the bake. Mm -hmm. And so it was kind of crispy on the outside and much thinner, but it was perfectly done in the middle, like soft and airy and lovely. And then because of you've like food processed the bacon, it's that the piece is like minuscule. So it's not like you're not getting big chunks of bacon. Yeah, yeah. Wow. And just it added this real like lovely, salty. Yes umami flavor and nice. it was we ate so much of it like warm out the oven like and the only way. it was just it i would absolutely would make it again and i don't know if i would even make it in a small i would try it maybe in a smaller pan yeah but yeah i would absolutely make it again it was delicious nice i was into it do you think i could try it with corn bacon then is that yeah, what you're saying i think it would work perfectly <laughs> yeah she didn't that was the only recipe she had for like this bolognese style one so i don't know if it's always has bacon or if it, it it's just like a yeah yeah I don't know. yeah yeah sometimes there are like a type of there's a type of dish or something like say like a frittata or something it's not a frittata but she, the only then recipe will be a meat one and you're like oh okay I won't have that one then. Yeah. <laughs> or you could just leave it out, but like, you know that it's going to be missing something. Yeah, like this, you couldn't, probably shouldn't leave the no, bacon no way. out. Capers. <laughs> yeah, capers. Nature's bacon. <laughs> Nature's tiny bacons. <laughs> right, my second thing, I'll whisk through, because I feel like I talked about that bread for a long time, um, is the baked rigatoni with bolognese meat sauce. Oh, so we're staying in Bologna. <laughs> staying in Bologna. <laughs> I've been to Bologna. <laughs> and... I've eaten the fucking bolognese meat sauce and it was incredible. So no, totally. That I, I saw that. I love that. Rigatoni as well is one of my favourite um, yeah. pasta shapes. It's so good. That's it. And I feel like I wanted to make, it's fun to make a bolognese and, I, and it is yeah. like long. I'll talk about it. It's yeah, long. Yeah. But I feel like don't bolognese. fuck around with the, don't fuck around with the bolognese. I'm ignoring that. <laughs> you didn't hear that. Hannah said bolognese. <laughs> When I talk, you say all these insightful <laughs> things like, oh, and what kind of dish did you use for that? And then I just sit here thinking of shit puns. <laughs> yes, I don't think it's worth doing a bolognese sauce unless you're you're doing it long, <laughs> if you're spending a long time doing it. Yeah. Because uh, what's the point? It's basically a culmination of two different recipes baked with rigatoni. And I just need to tell you why I can't, I couldn't just make the bolognese sauce and eat it with pasta. And that is because we talked about overexposure to fusilli earlier, but I had an overexposure to spaghetti bolognese as a, as a young person. Oh, I mean, didn't everybody, wasn't that like one of the main days yeah. of our childhood bringing up and like probably not the most authentic to be yeah. fair. Look, my mom's spaghetti bolognese is great. I yeah, love her. Same here. She does it great. But like my younger brother really liked it and demanded it pretty much at every meal for about five years. And imbecile. Yeah. <laughs> and I, so I, I feel like I can't eat it any longer. Yeah, okay. Sometimes even now my mom be like, I've made spaghetti bolognese. And I'm like, oh, <laughs> woman <laughs> says it to my brother. <laughs> I'm happy for you. And I'm let you eat that spaghetti bolognese. But what else do you have? <laughs> So this was a good way of using it in a different way. You know, thought about lasagna, but I always feel like the payoff is never as good as the time and energy it takes to make lasagna when you could just buy it from the shop. <gasps> I disagree. I love lasagna. Wow. I love it. I think it's great. But I just making it is hard oh. and long. Oh, I beg to differ. Like, I, I feel like the ones you buy in the shop are shit. I mean, <laughs> Yeah. But what did you make? Oh my God. True. I, th I don't think the difference there is big enough for me to make oh, it. I said big difference. This is one of our points of difference here. Maybe. I mean, no, I mean, I'll make you my bolognese and we'll see. Oh, I'll make you my lasagna. Complete with Please. corn mince. You hold, you buckle up there. <laughs> <laughs> I would love it. <laughs> and we'll see what you think. <laughs> But anyway. Right. So you do her bolognese, which takes at least four hours. So it's very standard sauce. It is onion, celery, and carrots. 
the classic, the trifecta. Mir plat. It, it makes a big old recipe. 85 grams of onion. I used about an onion and a bit. Three sticks of celery, four medium carrots. Why say four carrots, but then 85 grams of onion? That is my one thing. It was what one of my yeah, well. like two teaspoons of chopped garlic. What are we talking in cloves here, Marcella? That's what I need to know. Yeah. I mean, you've got to sh- shout out to her because she has both metric and imperial yeah. measurements for all of her yeah. recipes. So we love her for that. Have we mentioned <laughs> <laughs> that we don't like cups or uh, measurements that you can't understand? Oil and butter in the pan first, interestingly. Ground beef. Only 350 grams. It's a big mm. recipe. So I thought that was interesting. So pepper, milk. So you do a little milk Thing. so after you've put the beef in and that's kind of cooked down a little bit you add milk which is yes I think quite traditional but a method that is skipped here absolutely that's one of the things that I was came up when I was reading about her actually was this kind of that was revolutionary I think at the time to hear that you put oh, milk right. in this ragu and it's, it was a total game changer for loads of people yeah milk and no and not as much tomato as you would think, mm. you know. I feel like everyone knows that now, but like like when we were growing up, yeah. like it was just it was a tomato sauce with beef in it. Yeah, yeah. Nutmeg, interestingly. Wine. So you kind of you put the milk in, you let that kind of soak up until there's no milk left. Yeah. You do the same with the wine. Mm-hmm. And then once that's once the wine has kind of evaporated, then you put five hundred grams of tinned imported Italian plum tomatoes uh in. Okay. So that was good. So only 500 grams. Things come in 400 gram cans here. So that's that was a thing. But it's not like you can't use a jar of tomatoes somewhere else. <laughs> yeah, so you just kind of, that all goes in at different stages. Like I said, evaporates down, blah, blah, blah. And then once the tomatoes are in, you just leave it to simmer. She talks about it like it needs to be simmering, but only like the very rare bubble mm-hmm. to be coming up. <laughs> I'm doing a little hand gesture. On the very uh, rare bubbles. To show you about bubbles. <laughs> uh, rare bubbles. For three to four hours. Whoa. Yeah. And she says, she says, as long as you finish it in the same day, if you need to go out and come back, turning it off, it's fine. Okay. And you can top it up with water. It just sits on the hob. It's, it's uncovered, interestingly. Mm-hmm. I didn't have to top mine up with water. It seemed to have enough, which was good. And make sure house house smell delicious. Mm, I'm sorry. Which is great. So once that's done, you pop some pasta on, your rigatoni. Mm -hmm. Because that's such a big recipe, she wants 675 grams of rigatoni. Wow. I don't have a dish big enough to bake all of that in. So I halved the recipe and now we've got a bolognese sauce for the freezer. And and then you make a bechamel, Mm -hmm. her bechamel, Mm -hmm. which is fine. Really straightforward bechamel. No pepper in in the bechamel, which I would always put some pepper in, Mm. but maybe that's just me and then you just mix it all together and bake it nice oh you put some parmesan whilst you're mixing it through yeah and then you sprinkle on some parmesan on the top you only put it in the oven for like 10 minutes just to kind of just to get a crust on it right. so it's not like really crusty on top but it's yeah. only got a little bit of parmesan anyway like i think she says like two tablespoons okay yeah over the top and it's like a i cooked it in like my le creuset like casserole dish yeah and then it comes out you leave it to sit for a bit fucking nice oh, so it nice. tastes like yeah. a lasagna because you put a bechamel through it yeah so it's like kind of creamy and nice and but you're not it's not like layered in the same way because yeah. i when i read it i was like I, I presumed it would be layered yeah a bit like a lasagna like you put the bechamel on top but mm. you mix it through which mm. i was like mm, that's interesting nice. but i thought it was great yeah i really 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 liked it it's a labor of love but Right there. It's a really like hearty, yeah. warming dish. Yeah, yeah. That I feel cool. like you can't go wrong if you've got like meat eaters. So I was very happy to have it. Delicious. Would you make it again? Yeah, definitely. Even better, like the next day. Like I had it today yeah. for lunch, and it was it was great. Oh yeah, uh, it's worth it. Just just freeze it and have it, and like such an yeah. easy good dinner. Then like just a, just a sauce on its own to like put yes. with spaghetti or. Well, she says never spaghetti, actually. The Italians would never put it with spaghetti. You just uh, have with tagliatelle or um, even rigatoni or other yeah. penne, things like that. Take that, little brother. Yeah, take that, Jonathan, you little prick. 
Just joking. Love you. Anyway, <laughs> what did you make? <laughs> Probably not I... meat sauce and bacon focaccia, right? So I also <laughs> made two things, but I guess it's a similar vibe in that I made one p- pasta and one kind of bready thing. Oh, yay. Which I kind of only discovered that whole section towards the end with the breads and stuff like quite late. And then I was Me like, oh my too. God, this is great. I need to do something uh, here. I was a bit sad. I was like, oh, there's no pizza or no like focaccia yeah. or whatever. And then, uh, yeah, it's right at the end after yeah. the dessert. So so, you know, that's a critique. Save the best to last. The, the pasta that I made was, um, well, I guess it's just the so- the recipe is just for the sauce and she recommends what pasta shape you should put it with. But it was as if we didn't have enough courgettes in our lives. It should be the courgette <laughs> circle. Courgette sauce with basil and beaten egg yolk. Oh, oh, beaten egg yolk. Yeah. So I was thinking maybe it's like, you know, a little veggie carbonara kind of vibe. Maybe this is the closest that we get yeah, to it. Yeah, it sounds glossy. That's what I was <laughs> You just kind of get so you soak some courgettes, you soak them whole, which is weird, for 20 minutes in cold water and then wash them free of all grit. Whole, not peeled. Peeled, yeah, no, no. I think they were just dirty little courgettes that she's using. Ugh. I don't know. Dirty I guess she presumes courgettes. you're making them in your <laughs> dirty little courgettes. I've bad name of the week. Uh, I guess <laughs> she presumes you're making them in your garden because they're very yeah. easy to making them. Growing, I think, is the right verb. I'm doing really good with my verbs. <laughs> but, um, then you kind of cut them into long sticks, three inches long, and you pat them dry. And then you f- you heat some oil. You fry the strips of courgette in the oil. And you kind of have to do that in batches, to, just until they're like a light brown colour, she says. So they're not like, you haven't like breaded them or battered them. They're just no, straight up fried? Straight up Ooh. fried. And then at the same time, you kind of get your pasta going. Um, so she says to use fusilli if you want um, beware of overexposure <laughs> <laughs> or the long corkscrew strands and like as ever i do i often do my cooking for this on a sunday night when all the good shops are shut and i'm just going to like a shitty local one but i got this mafaldine pasta mafaldine oh. that's fucking awful pronunciation i'm sure but it's like a long wavy kind of guy it's like tagliatelle it's like a cur- a slightly wavier tagliatelle oh yeah it looks fun yeah fun pasta so you get that <laughs> cooking then you kind of pour out the oil from the frying pan after you've taken the courgettes out obviously and then you put in some butter and you let the butter foam and then you've like mixed a bit of a t- i think it's like a tablespoon of flour in with like six tablespoons of milk so you're making like effectively like a little roux yeah so you put that flour and milk into the butter and then you stir that for half a minute, add a pinch of salt, and then you put in your courgette strips into there. So they get kind of coated oh. in this like little like roux kind of bechamel kind of sauce. Yeah. Cook that for about a minute. So the courgettes are all coated. And then you take it off the heat and you put in a bit more butter. To your point, there is a fair bit of butter in this. <laughs> um, and beaten egg yolk. So it creates this kind of like emulsified, like quite creamy sauce. Oh. And then you literally just put, you add your pasta into that sauce and you put in some Parmesan and Romano cheese, which I just did Parmesan. Cause, you can't get that. Yeah, here, no, man. really not. And then some torn up basil leaves. So you just mm. pop in some cheeses and, and basil leaves and you just toss it all together and then you serve it. That sounds great. I've never heard any like that before. exactly right i hadn't heard of anything like that and i thought that's so interesting and doable and yeah it was delicious it was really really delicious i really rate her seasoning actually she always like tells you when to season and how much and it's always like spot on i think yeah. and she does that quite a lot with that recipe so it was just really delicious it's just really really nice i'm not i don't mm. i don't make courgette with pasta that much but what kind of like texture does the courgette end up I guess it's like quite soft, but then it gets like a bit cream, gets a bit creamy in that sauce. And then it's because they're long strips and you've got, I use like a longish pasta. Mm. It's all just like kind of a lovely little forkful that you're swirling yeah, up together. Yeah, yeah. But it still has a bit mm. of texture. It's not too, it's it's not like completely overcooked or anything. It's a bit of crunch from the frying. So yeah, I would 100% do that again on like wow. as a go-to supper. It was really, really delicious. Yeah, that sounds great and very original. Very original. I love just- it. Just like me. Just like me. <laughs> I'm um, excited to see the uh, picture of that. Yes. Don't get too excited. As you know, my <laughs> photos are always pretty shit. <laughs> and then the second thing I made was just 
today, actually. You don't need to know that, but there you go. <laughs> and it was this thing called a, that I'd never heard of before called a Sfunchuni. Sfunchuni. <laughs> Sfunchuni? Sfinchuni, oh. Sfinchuni, seen... Sfin and they're in the focaccia pizza bread section. Yeah, and I was like, "Huh, what's this?" And basically, it's like a pizza dough base, very thin, and then like a filling, and then you put more pizza dough on top, crimp it all together, and you make effectively like a, pie. a pizza pie. <laughs> Allora. Allora, it's a pizza pie. <laughs> I think I did see these. They sound great. Yeah. There's a, there's a little, it's from Palermo. There's a little intro um, on page 669. Uh, it says that these are to Palermo what pizza is to Naples and the rest of the world. Baked dough supporting a topping. And yeah, two thin round layers of firm dough, which enclose a stuffing called the conza. And they're sealed all around. So the original recipe that she uses is with meat and cheese. She doesn't name the meat, but meat. <laughs> any meat. But then she gives some variations, and one of them is broccoli and ricotta. Ooh. So that's what I did. So it was Ooh. like a broccoli and ricotta sfinchuni. I sfinchuni. love that. It's a bit like you know Domino's double decker pizza, <laughs> but, <laughs> but better. Yeah, yeah. Doesn't that have toppings on top? Yeah, too? yeah, yeah. It does. Yes, yeah, it was just a filling. But yeah, so the the dough was tricky. I will say that it was like just plain flour, yeast, water, salt, tablespoon of olive oil, a little bit of milk as well. She likes her milk. A pinch of sugar, and you kind of mix it all together. And she gives you very she gives you instructions whether you're doing it by hand or by food processor actually which I didn't have one so I was doing it by hand but it was very sticky it was so sticky and you know when like I really need someone to say in a recipe the dough will be really sticky but mm. don't worry or something because otherwise it was just like she does say it shouldn't the dough should feel soft and compact and no longer stick to the hands but it was really sticky so I did end up adding like quite a lot of extra flour yeah 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 I was worried that it was really going to affect it but there was just no other way to deal with it so you kind of were meant to do this like whole slapping against the counter thing and I was just like I was kind of slapping it and bits were flying it was all very wet <laughs> was, your ceiling's ruined yeah, it was just a bit comedy but I persevered because I'm a trooper that way and just kept adding flour and um then you kind of managed I just like needed it and it, it seemed like it was in a better place so then I put it aside and then you leave it to rise she said for three hours or until it's doubled in size but I don't know if my kitchen is like a fucking sauna or something it was doubled in like two hours or something so again I was a little bit worried that it was going to be overproof but anyway I also think that like yeast technology has moved on since this book was written and like a lot of these like older baking books have written were written yeah you're not strong so I think that you know they're, they're like fast action yeast they're like fucking I mean like fast yeah totally <laughs> I agree but in the meantime while that's rising you can get on with your filling which is just basically you boil up some broccoli you don't boil it for a very long time because you don't want it gets cooked again later and then you drain it chop it into one inch pieces and then this is when your two teaspoons of chopped garlic come in you fry off two teaspoons of chopped garlic in four tablespoons of olive oil it smells so good mm. garlicky broccoli it's just a great thing. Yeah. So, you, yeah, you kind of cook that garlic and then you put the, the chopped broccoli in with the garlic and the olive oil and you cook, the, add some salt and then you just cook that for five minutes all together. So it gets to know each other. And then you let that set that aside and you let it cool completely. Mine was still a bit warm. But anyway, I wanted to work while the dough was still OK. You're meant to have a baking stone and a peel so that you can like put the baking stone into preheat and then you can yeah. like put the thing on the peel and shove it in the on the stone. I didn't have any of yeah, those but... things, of course. So I just put in a baking tray to preheat in the oven and then I prep the dough on like a piece of grease proof. Nice. And then just put it in. So yeah, then you get your grease proof because I did. You put some like polenta or cornmeal on the base and then you, you're meant to roll out the dough to like 10 inches diameter. Mm. but it was again like really fucking sticky so I ended up just like you know when you see them like making pizza and they're like just stretching it by hand yeah like just pulling it yeah I was just doing that because I was like fuck this is just so sticky so I thought it had all gone horribly wrong but it turned out okay so then you once you've got that stretch out you put a tablespoon of breadcrumbs onto the base you put on bread over loads of ricotta onto the breadcrumbs mm. then you put the broccoli with the garlic and stuff on top of there and then you put grated parmesan on top of course 
I took a picture before it went in the oven because it just looks so pretty. You know, the little cloud of parmesan that I love. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. And then you put more breadcrumbs on top and then you drizzle some olive oil on top. And then you put your second pastry or your second dough lid on top of that. Yeah. And again, that was hard. I was like trying to stretch it out. And then you kind of tuck it under the bottom base so that it doesn't. And there was a couple of like little thin bits on top. And I thought that's going to explode. But um, it was it was fine in the end and then you just put it in the oven and you bake it for like 25 minutes she nice. says to you, you sorry brush the top layer with water and then yeah bake it for 25 minutes and then she says to leave it for like half an hour when it gets out of the oven which i rate i really like that uh, you said you had to leave something of yours for a couple yeah of, um, yeah the rigatoni yeah. yeah you have to rest it so that's it's right right because when it's too hot it just doesn't taste of anything and then yeah you slice it and eat it that sounds great and it was so good it was it sounds really amazing. really really good because I guess because it's such a wet dough if you if you think of a classic pizza dough and you are having two layers of that that's going to be really heavy right but this one because it's quite wet is really thin and, yeah. and light and not that heavy all in all and it was just so delicious I do think you could play around and like if you wanted like a slightly stronger cheese than ricotta in there you could definitely mm. do that um, and she does say that you should play around with fillings and stuff, but would 100% make that again. It was bloody great. Loved it. I can imagine like just like being in Italy and like just picking up a slice of that from somewhere yes. and like walking around with it like in a little paper bag or something. Like, and it'd be so good. Oh, like It was amazing. Tomato we want even or... Yeah, yeah. The the variations that she have has sound really good. There's the meat and cheese one. This one with tomato and anchovy that sounds great. And that sounds great. Yeah, would really really recommend that. It was delicious. Fun. Yeah. I guess the only thing is you have to be fairly confident with dough, like with yeast dough, yeah. because it was it was a bit fiddly at times. And I still I'm sure that whatever I ended up with probably wasn't the authentic version because I had to add so much flour to make it not sticky, but still tasted good. I added quite quite a bit of flour to my focaccia dough as well because mm. I thought it was too wet mm. so I don't know if it's just a again it's a flour thing yeah. or the water was less wet back in the day maybe yeah <laughs> <laughs> was there anything else that you saw that you wanted to make yeah loads actually there I've got many many little tabs aubergine cubes mushroom style oh I didn't see that it was basically literally that just like cubes of aubergine cooked up with um oil and parsley like wow. you would with beautiful like mushrooms and I just that really like caught my eye because I love mushrooms and I love oh, the aubergine, all the aubergine recipes actually I thought it looked great yeah. breaded aubergine cutlets mm -hmm. aubergine parm tomato sauce with pancetta and chili pepper that sounds great basically everything so I've I've tabbed the tomato sauce with onion and butter because I was like should I make that yeah a lot of the soups looked lovely lentil soup with pasta bacon and garlic sounds great love love bacon happening in here a lot you, yeah um yeah honestly there was absolutely loads of stuff that i wanted to make and I, I think i will like the pasta is so good even just for um inspiration yeah right like when you're looking for stuff yeah how about you i thought the bruschetta and stuff would be interesting to try her way yeah. because it's simple and delicious but i bet she does it really well there was um i know you're not a big frittata person but there was a whole frittata chapter that I thought looked nice there was like a mad one mm. mad with it was like a stuffed <laughs> spaghetti frittata with tomato and mozzarella and there's oh, ham in there too but I'd that. obviously leave it out but it, it, you make like two layers of frittata sandwiching a filling of pasta so it sounds nuts I think I'm just oh. really into all this mad shit like it's like the timpano thing from big night right I'm obsessed with yeah, these yeah, like yeah. layered things that they do in Italian food but yeah I, I mean I think the pizza would be really fun to try as well and a couple of the desserts there's a lot of almonds mm. French and Italians just love an almond but it's true there was an olive oil cake that I thought could be really really nice yeah to try. they were all like very like simple kind of rustic desserts and I thought that sounded good yeah 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 frankly after you've eaten that much an Italian yeah. meal that's so true loved it I loved it too and I feel like it's probably gonna be my go-to Italian book now yeah should we rate let's rate this Look, let's rate. let's rate. Let me tell you quickly about our rating system. So every episode we rate the book out of five, but we change the the rating every week based on the chef or the book or 
something funny that we find uh, within. So for example, we rated Delia Smith out of eggs because she is obsessed with eggs. I love an egg. Um, hate to bring him up again, but Jamie Oliver, we rated him out of photos of Jamie Oliver because there was lots of those in that book. And so Marcella, we are going to rate out of smothered vegetables. <laughs> I love it. I just love it. I love it too. There's just so like, many. Yeah, let us know what you would like to be smothered in <laughs> if you were in this recipe book. <laughs> I've said ramen. Hannah is happy with butter and cheese. Yes, yeah. um, we're asking you. Tell us what we what you what you should be. <laughs> yes, and we rate out of five categories, and those categories are usability and accessibility. That's one. <laughs> Ingredients used. <laughs> Aesthetics. Is the book veggie friendly? and inspirability do we love it are we inspired by it so it's, hannah how many smothered vegetables are you giving this book okay for usability and accessibility that's one i'm giving it one because <laughs> <laughs> everything everything was really easy to find mm. and easy to you could tell at times that she taught cookery right because she, yeah. she doesn't assume anything it's it's all pretty yeah um descriptive ingredients used also another one gonna give that one there was nothing that was too hard yeah. to find aesthetics might just give it a half on aesthetics because mm. i whilst i've previously awarded full points on the kudos of having a certain book on your book- bookshelf which i think would also um apply to this one i think there could be more illustrations maybe or something yeah veggie friendly i'm actually going to give it one because i there is a lot of veggie stuff in here and I did say earlier that there's sometimes a, a dish that doesn't have a veggie one, but you could leave the meat out most of the time. There was something else going on in there that was interesting. And there's whole like vegetable sections and everything. So even if they mm. are smothered. <laughs> so yeah. And inspirability, I'm going to give it one as well. So I'm going to get four and a half smothered vegetables. Nice. What about you? So I, I feel like I'm the same. So I was actually going to dock half for veggie friendliness okay. but i'm going to take your lead because you are the veggie yeah and completely give it a one and i also was docking half for aesthetics because like like i said it's it's nice but yeah. you know there are no pictures and some of the time you know you need that guidance yeah when it's something you haven't so yeah i would have liked that but yes i'm inspired yes uh, ingredients all that stuff usability brilliant so four and a half smother vegetables Woo. Do we think no? Out of five? Is it deserving of its top top place on the lists? I'm gonna say yes. Yeah, I think so. I think so. Like I would, you know, again, I, like we will say this. I'd like to be there at the time it came out yeah. and understand like how, how, what a difference this made and like was this like the first Italian cookbook? Yeah, that I understand that it was like the first kind of hmm. comprehensive. Well. The two before it were, right? And then, then, yeah. and then she, this version added like 50 new recipes or something. So then it became right. even more of a encyclopedia. But yeah, my understanding is that there was nothing really else out at that time that kind of brought everything together in such a easy way, I guess. Yeah, it still works. It's not like some of the French books that we've had that are just like... A bit age. It's got brain in it. Yeah. And it's got, you know, it's got stuff that just doesn't make sense like it's all just for ingredients that you can still buy and are still available and still tastes great italian food man i would love to know her views on american italian cooking like seeing as she lived in new york yeah. and like it's so different right it's not the same at all like it's a really specific genre of food yeah like baked ziti and yes. other things so yeah I've, I've... deep fried ravioli yeah, and she does deep. There, there are like fried kind of pasta dumplings or something in here as well. And I was mm. thinking that's probably the predecessor to fried ravioli, right? Like it's just yeah. Uh, from what I can understand, she she was quite explicit about it. if she didn't think something should be on something, she would say it. So I think right. she might have a thing or two to say about the way it's gone. <laughs> What's happened? <laughs> Haven't here? we all red sauce? that's it what are we gonna do for the last episode just make stupid jokes and puns (laughs) uh bitch about jamie oliver i guess why change a habit of a lifetime (laughs) i'm gonna try and sell this a little bit better than (laughs) (laughs) no we will be doing one last episode episode 20 (laughs) and it will be a delight to your ears but we'll look at some of the books that we didn't cover on the list and why 
Ooh. Mm. I look back at some of our favorite moments in the episodes. Yeah, it's going to be nice. Whatever else we can come up with between now and then. <laughs> there probably will be mention of Otterengi and Jamie Oliver and French food. Well, it has to be because we've done a lot of French books. But it will be yeah, fun. It will be We've fun. done 19 books. Yeah, and then we'll wrap the Not season. Ooh. That's a wrap. It's a wrap. Anyway, we'll tell you more about that the next time. And thank you for listening. Thank you for listening. Bye. And go buy this book. Bye. Go buy the book. Bye. Bye. Thanks so much for listening to this episode of The Cookbook Circle. Don't forget to subscribe wherever you listen to your podcast. And if you've enjoyed it, please leave us a review as it helps others to find us. You can see how the recipes from this episode turned out on our Instagram, at Cookbook Circle. And if you make anything from the books we talk about, please don't forget to tag us. See you next time. Bye. Bye.